Welcome, everyone. My name is Ted O'Connell. I'm one of the authors of Crush Step 1, the ultimate USMLE Step 1 review. This is the second edition of the book, and we're going through it chapter by chapter. This is part one of the dermatology chapter. We're going to start by talking about histology and physiology, and then move on to describing lesions. The skin is divided into the dermis and the overlying epidermis. The cellular component of the dermis consists of fibroblasts, adipocytes, and macrophages. The majority of the dermis, however, is acellular connective tissue composed primarily of type 1 collagen for strength, elastin for flexibility, and glycosaminoglycans. The, derma t the dermis is mechanically responsible for cushioning the body and is also the site of the skin's adnexal structures such as hair follicles, lymphatics, nerve fibers, and blood vessels. The superficial location of these blood vessels is particularly important in thermoregulation because vasodilation allows for increased heat loss to the environment while vasoconstriction helps to retain heat. The skin can increase heat loss through arteriolar vasodilation and evaporation from eccrine sweat glands. The epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin and consists primarily of keratinocytes arranged as stratified squamous epithelium. Melanocytes, Langerhan cells, and Merkel cells can also be found in the epidermis. The deepest epidermal layer is the stratum basale, which contains keratinocyte stem cells resting on a basement membrane. These cells divide and migrate upward to populate the stratum spinosum, where keratinization begins. The cells continue to migrate superficially as they mature. After they have reached the stratum granulosum, Cross-linking of keratin continues, organelles begin to disappear, and the keratinocytes produce lamellar bodies, which are lipid-containing secretions that form a hydrophobic membrane. The granular appearance of these lamellar bodies gives this layer its name. In areas with thick skin, such as the palms and soles, the next layer is called the stratum lucidum, also meaning clear layer. It consists of densely packed cells that appear transparent under the microscope. Lastly, cells become part of the stratum corneum, where their nuclei are completely absent and keratin has formed a watertight barrier. And here you can refer to figure 3-1. From superficial to deep, the skin layers are corneum, lucidum in thick skin, granulosum, spinosum, and basale. There's a mnemonic for this. California ladies give superb back rubs, where the first letter of each of that part of the mnemonic is corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and basale. The skin has two major functions, thermoregulation and protection. Thermoregulation is accomplished through vasodilation or vasoconstriction of superficial arterioles, arterioles that is, in hot conditions, arterioles dilate and shunt blood toward the skin surface, allowing for heat loss to the environment. Eccrine glands also promote heat loss through evaporation of sweat. The barrier function of skin is not only mechanical, that is keratinization, and immuno immunologic through longer hand on cells, but also chemical because ultraviolet light is converted to harmless heat using melanin. Now let's talk about melanocytes. These are epidermal cells that produce melanin and package them within melanosomes, which can be phagocytosed by surrounding keratinocytes. By the process of internal conversion, melanin converts mutagenic UV radiation into harmless heat. It is also responsible for the color of an individual's skin. Those with darker skin tones, however, do not have more melanocytes. They pro produce melanosomes in greater number and size with greater distribution among keratinocytes. Melanocyte activation is under neurohormonal control of melanocyte-stimulating hormone, a cleavage product of adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. It is not surprising, then, that the elevated ACTH in patients with Addison disease causes them to have darker skin, Melanoma arises from a malignant proliferation of melanocytes. Of note, melanin is synthesized from the amino acid tyrosine. It is not just responsible for coloring the skin, but also the iris, the hair, and the substantia nigra of the brainstem. 
Neuromelanin is a metabolite of dopamine and norepinephrine, which are also synthesized from tyrosine. Therefore, melanoma can arise in any of these areas. Now let's talk about longer Hans cells. These are dendritic antigen-presenting cells that populate the dermis and epidermis, essentially the macrophage of the skin. After they have taken up antigen, they become active and migrate to lymph nodes, where they can interact with T and B cells. In this way, they act as a link between innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Of note, Langerhans cells in the mucosa of the vagina and foreskin are thought to be the initial target of human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Merkel cells are sensory neuroendocrine cells found in the stratum basale of the epidermis that communicate with large myelinated sensory afferents. They are responsible for fine touch, which is discussed more in chapter 13. Now we're going to talk about adnexal structures, starting with the eccrine glands. These are sweat glands that cover the majority of the human body and participate in thermoregulation by secreting hypotonic sodium chloride for evaporation. They are stimulated by cholinergic fibers in the sympathetic nervous system. Of note, anticholinergic medications and toxins, such as atropine, inhibit cholinergic stimulation of eccrine sweat glands and produce vasodilation of peripheral vessels, leaving the patient dry as a bone and red as a beet. And this is discussed more in the toxicology section of chapter 7. The apocrine glands are sweat glands that are found only in the axillae, genitoanal region, and areolae. They are activated at puberty and produce a viscous, protein-rich fluid that takes on its characteristic odor when metabolized by local bacteria. These are vestigial remnants of the mammalian sexual scent gland and serve no apparent function. The pilosebaceous unit is the hair fiber is composed of keratin that grows directly from the hair matrix. The erector pili muscle is responsible for piloerection, or goosebumps, which is a vestigial response to cold. The sebaceous glands produce sebum, which oils the skin and hair, preventing them from drying. Furthermore, sebum is somewhat toxic to bacteria. Sebaceous glands are activated by hormones during puberty and are also important in the pathogenesis of acne vulgaris. Now let's move on to describing lesions. A standard terminology has been defined to describe der to describe dermatologic findings. These can be defined, divided into primary lesions and secondary lesions. Secondary lesions derive from primary lesions and are caused by trauma, evolution, or other modification of the primary lesion. Then we're going to switch over to table 3-3 that explains common histologic terms that describe dermatologic lesions. But first, let's go through the primary lesions. A macule is a flat lesion less than a half centimeter. A patch is a flat lesion greater than a half centimeter. A papule is a raised lesion less than half centimeter. A plaque is a raised lesion greater than a half centimeter. A vesicle is a fluid-filled blister less than a half centimeter. A bulla is a fluid-filled blister greater than a half centimeter. A pustule is a pus-filled le pus lesion. A nodule is a firm or indurated lesion, usually located in the dermis or subcutaneous fat. It may or may not be raised. A wheel is, a derm is dermal edema leading to a raised erythematous pruritic lesion lasting less than 24 hours. Now let's talk about secondary lesions. An excoriation is trauma to the skin caused by scratching. It is characterized by linear breaks in the epidermis, and scabies is an example of this. Lichenification is a thick, rough area with accentuated skin lines, usually the result of repeated trauma or scratching, and eczema is an example of this. A crust is a dried collection of serum, blood, pus, epithelial cells, and or bacteria. An impetigo is an example of this. A scale is a fragment of stratum, cor stratum corneum or keratin, a top or peeling from the rest of the epidermis. 
is often secondary to rapid epidermal turnover, and psoriasis, characterized by a silvery scale, is an example of this. An erosion is an incomplete loss of epidermis causing shallow, moist, and well-circumscribed lesion. An example is pemphigus vulgaris, which is secondary to a ruptured bullae. An ulceration is complete loss of epidermis with or without destruction of subcutaneous tissue and fat. And a basal cell carcinoma is an example of this, which may have a central ulceration. Now let's talk about a few histologic terms. Hyperkeratosis is thickening of the stratum corneum, and a callus is an example of this. Parakeratosis is thickening of the stratum corneum with persistence of nuclei, which is normally absent at this layer, and psoriasis is an example of this. Acanthosis is thickening of the stratum spinosum, and Acanthosis nigricans is an example of this. Acantholysis is separation of keratinocytes due to the loss of intercellular cohesion, and pemphigus vulgaris is an example of this. That's the end of part one of the dermatology chapter. Please join us next time for part two when we talk about pathology and common dermatologic conditions.